You're now watching Sports Better's Paradise on the Bet Rivers Network. All right, Jimmy, out along with Paul Stone. It's our best bets portion uh, of the uh, week. And let's get right to it, Paul. And let's look at the big one in the Big 12. And I've been looking at this one for quite some time. A lot returning for the Oklahoma State Cowboys. They're 3-0. and Got lucky. Let's face it. They were fortunate when they got a out, out game by more than 250 yards at home by Arkansas. I think Arkansas is still going up and down the field. But anyway, and then Utah, and they started out great. And then Cam Rising, I mean, he only had seven touchdowns, zero interceptions, and back-to-back plays, uh, touchdown passes against Baylor after Baylor's Daquan Finn uh, had a, uh, a turnover deep in their own territory. But... You know that Kyle Winningham and uh, injury uh, status information. There's some, been some movement on this line currently. It is at two and a half. We saw it get to three uh, for a second. But this could be the only Big 12 game all season long where Utah is the underdog. So here we go. We've been looking forward to this one for quite some time. Both teams 3-0. and Oklahoma State two and a half at home in Stillwater. Yeah, Jimmy, I mean, the $64,000 question here, obviously the availability of quarterback uh, Cam Rising, who suffered a thumb injury on his throwing hand in that 23-12 victory over Baylor in week two. As you mentioned, Utah head coach Kyle Whittingham, he doesn't uh, tip his hand uh, whatsoever on injuries. Uh, so it's difficult to know exactly what his status is. There have been some reports that Rising has been – practicing. Uh, he has had a, uh, a towel or some type of cover uh, when the media has been present on that right hand, supposedly. So, uh, you know, you've got to think if there's any way possible for him to play, this being perhaps the biggest game in the Big 12 season for Utah, that he will try to play. But we do have to ask our questions. First of all, will he play? And secondly, uh, if he does play, how effective will he be given the uh, nature of his injury? Utah, uh, they had been a small favorite in this game uh, this week until Wednesday afternoon until a respected individual uh, or group apparently came in strong on the Oklahoma State side, flipping the line to, like you said, three at one point uh, yesterday there at Bet Rivers, now down to Oklahoma State favored by two and a half. You look at this Oklahoma State team to this point in the season, they are 3-0, and so they don't have any blemishes on their record. Uh, but the Cowboys have been far from flawless. You mentioned the game against uh, Arkansas, a fortunate, to put it mildly, 39-31 victory over the Razorbacks. Arkansas put up 648 yards on Oklahoma State in that game. And also a little bit of a concern, running back, All-America running back, Ollie Gordon, off to a slow start. You know, he rushed for over 1,700 yards last year. This year through three games, only 216 uh, yards rushing total, only averaging 3.5 yards per carry against really a slate of three pretty mediocre defenses. So a little bit of concern there. But Oklahoma State, as you mentioned, a veteran team on both sides of the ball. They've started slowly before. We saw it last year, a loss to South Alabama at home. So I'm not pushing the panic button just yet on the Cowboys Boom Pickens Stadium, one of the more raucous environments in all of college football. They're going to be hammering those paddles on the side of the stadium uh, come Saturday afternoon. Uh, and in what is shaping uh, up to be one of the bigger games in the entire balance Big 12 this season, I'm going to call on the Cowboys to get the victory by a field goal or more. I like Oklahoma State, minus two and a half. Uh, there at Bet Rivers. All right, the Pokes, the Paul's picks there, minus the two and a half right now at home uh, in Stillwater. Talking about raucous environments to play, how about Morgantown, West Virginia? Didn't didn't own up to that because the team was so sloppy in that game against Penn State. And then they now, now all of a sudden they find themselves one and two because uh, the backyard brawl, they're in control of that game until at the end. <clears throat> until they gave up a 73 and 75 yard drives by Eli Holstein. Now I had Pitt last week. We'll cash a ticket, but you know that was uh we were fortunate uh, to say the least. So, you know, they outgained uh, they outgained uh, Pitt by uh, 160 I mean, I'm sorry, by 20 21 yards. So you take away the 73 and 75 that that's they're all gaining by 170 70 yards in, into the fourth quarter of play. They also were minus two in the turnover battle 
against Pitt last week. So West Virginia did everything but win uh, on the road against a pretty good team and a hot quarterback. On the other on the other side, you're talking about experienced teams, talking about Oklahoma State. Kansas is one of the more senior-laden teams in all of college football this year. But they're off to a one and two start. And what is going on with Jalen Daniels? Well, there was some shakeup on the offensive staff, and that's not a that's not a popular group uh, right now. Daniels is only averaging 6.2 yards per attempt, and get this, twice as many interceptions as touchdowns. Only three touchdown passes, six interceptions for one of the more talented uh, quarterbacks. How much of the injuries have affected uh, his play as well? So West Virginia at home, tough luck loser. Uh, Kansas on the other side. Until I see Jalen Daniels in this offense and this new offensive staff kind of get their traction, it's a tough assignment to go on the road and take on West Virginia. I'm going with the Mountaineers minus the two and a half at Kansas. Any thoughts on that West Virginia, Kansas, Paul? Yeah, I like I like your side there. I think this situation uh, just uh, is more favorable to the Mountaineers playing at home, and it's just very uh, troublesome. The performance of Jalen Daniels, considering he only, I think, appeared in three games last year, uh, didn't play the last half of the season at all, and to have thrown six interceptions through three games uh, and the low uh, yards per attempt average just doesn't seem like he's the same player. Whatever, you know, the offensive coordinator, obviously, he's gone. He, he's dealt with injury issues. So you mix it all together, and, and he just hadn't been the same guy. So until we see – the Jalen Daniels uh, at his best, I think we have to expect more of the same. Uh, and this West Virginia team is, is close to being 2-1, and one, as you alluded to. So I like the Mountaineers as well at home. All right, let's move on. And a Big Ten matchup. And you know what these two teams have in common? Probably the most scenic settings uh, in all the Big Ten, maybe uh, in the entire country. This is outstanding here. Northwestern, if you ever seen their athletic facility, I mean, it's on the shores of Lake Michigan with the views of downtown Chicago. And then they're renovating their stadium and they're playing in this little uh, soccer stadium, or which uh, would have you. And then some of their games at Wrigley Field as well. And then sailgating in Seattle. That's right, Northwestern at Washington is a Big Ten conference game. But that is really cool as well when it comes uh, to college football it's funny that both are uh, just outside of uh, of pro towns uh, but uh, man some great college settings there but let's get to the game both teams are two and one and both teams could be three and oh Northwestern lost a tough one uh, on Friday night uh, at home in overtime to Duke they lost a late lead there and Washington was one yard away against Wazoo in the Apple Cup fourth and one to get stuffed for a two-yard loss now uh, they, they go to Seattle Washington, 10-and-a-half-point favorites here against the visiting Wildcats, Paul. Yeah, this is the first ever Big Ten conference game for new member Washington. Uh, and so they, there's got to be some excitement about that. But I still view Saturday's game uh, against Northwestern as sort of a tricky scheduling spot for the Huskies. You know, they're, they're a double-digit uh, favorite, first of all, and they're off such an uh, emotional loss in the – Apple Cup to bitter rival Washington State, as you described, uh, fourth and goal run attempt comes up just short in the final seconds. Uh, and uh, additionally, they have road games on deck at Rutgers and Iowa sandwiched around a home game against defending national champion Michigan, and they got to play Northwestern first. So I think this is a favorable uh, scheduling spot for Northwestern, maybe a little bit unfavorable for Washington Northwestern, one of those programs in my mind that just seems to get more out of less. They don't have the, the equal talent to some of their Big Ten brethren year in and year out. They typically play solid defense, fundamentally sound. And also, as I've kind of indicated, they're rarely a circled opponent for their opponents. So it's not like their uh, opponent has been looking forward to playing Northwestern all year. So I believe these factors all play a role uh, and why the, the Wildcats have really thrived as a road underdog. And they've been one of the better road underdogs against the spread in college football over the last decade. They are 24-13 uh, and 13 against the spread uh, in the role of road underdogs since the beginning of the 2014 season. So they've done really well in this role. I mean, the Purple Cats, they're going to fight, scratch, and claw, you know, to try to compete, try to get a victory. So uh, I like them in this role. They've got a new quarterback. They started the year with Michael Wright, who uh, was the quarterback in that uh, Duke loss 
uh, a couple of weeks back, but they've gone to Jack Lausch and last week against Eastern uh, Illinois, which is an FCS opponent and not a very good FCS opponent, to put it mildly. Lausch threw for 227 yards, ran for another 62. So it sounds like he's got some pretty good feet. And Northwestern, uh, they don't have a whole lot of offensive weapons. So uh, a guy who can run the football a little bit adds l another dimension to that offense. So add it all together. And I like uh, Northwestern plus the points uh, over the Washington Huskies there in Seattle on Saturday. All right, so Northwestern plus a 10 and a half uh, at Seattle against the Washington Huskies. Let's move on to my next pick, and we're going to go to uh, a non-conference game, and we're going to go to where, you know, I like horse racing, Paul. It's like one team has been racing at Del Mar and one at Delta Downs. I mean, with the competition here. I mean, this is this is really, I mean, I mean Tulane has – Held their own, should have beaten Kansas State, was right there within five uh, in the ball uh, in the fourth quarter against Oklahoma. If you want for Oklahoma, does uh, cover the spread with two late touchdowns. And then uh, there's ULL. So uh, Tulane is uh, one and two, but certainly battle tested here and, and was very competitive against Kansas State uh, in Oklahoma. On the other side, uh, ULL, Grambling, Kennesaw State, and a bye. I mean, that is as light as it gets. Situationally, this is this is going against what I usually uh, pull. And uh, this is a, you know, after at Kansas State, after, uh, after Oklahoma, how excited are they to go to Lafayette to play this little sleepy road team against this? Yeah, well... Well, maybe a little surprise how fired up this uh, this this uh, fan base will be for this in-state rival. But this is just a matter of man after playing those teams, then playing a, a team that hasn't been pushed at all. So how much could they have improved by playing Grambling State, Kennesaw State, and then having a week off? So Tulane just the stronger team. They've proven. I know they can play with Kansas State. I know they can play with Oklahoma. And they had to get over that that tough angle of a freshman quarterback making his first true road start in a hostile environment in Mensa. And it showed. He turned the ball over a couple of times, but he's gotten that out of his system. This will be much easier to handle after facing that uh, that environment in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Battle-tested is going to win out the situational spot here. Give me the Greenies a uh, minus three over the Cajuns in Lafayette. Yeah, I mean, I, I love any time a man can bring in a, a horse racing analogy into their college football <laughs> handicapping. That, that's a good thing, Jimmy, so I respect that. And I was looking at Jeff Sagren's rankings. He does the schedule, strength of schedule, you know, uh, up to date. And Tulane's schedule currently ranked fifth in the nation, Louisiana Lafayette's 237th. So it's a small sample size, but it does give you an idea of the, the different level of opponents that they've played. Also, another thing I like here with Tulane is the fact not only that they're coming off back-to-back -back losses and they desperately need a win, but they've got a home game against the up-and-coming South Florida team next week in New Orleans. If they lose this game, they got to know in the back of their mind they might be facing a four-game losing streak. Uh, early in the season. So I think all uh, all hands are going to be on deck. It's going to be a little bit different approach uh, to this type of game uh, against this type of opponent than they might normally have. So I like your uh, two-lane pick there as well. Speaking of South Florida, Miami uh, going to Tampa. And Tampa, they sell way more tickets than they used to. Miami looks great. You picked them uh, in, our, in our summer shows uh, to make it to the playoff at a nice price especially up front. You know, everybody, everybody talks about Cam Ward, but, man, the line of scrimmage, man, they look really, really tough. Is that a sneaky little concern spot for you going to going to Tampa this weekend? Yeah, I mean, I think it. I'm, I'm bullish on Miami. I continue to be bullish on Miami. And like you indicated, I mean, they have, through the portal especially, they have just uh, shored up any uh, – uh, weaknesses in there they're better on both lines and uh, so I really like this Miami team but this is a this is a big game there in Tampa for the South Florida Bulls and they uh you know they went toe to toe with uh, Alabama a couple of weeks for much of the game and uh, I think uh, their coach there is building a, a program and uh, it just means everything to, to South Florida and 17 is a lot of points so I think it's a little bit of a, a tricky situation I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised to see it much like the Alabama game in terms of the game being tight for maybe two and a half quarters and then maybe the Hurricanes uh, talent prevailing for maybe a two-touchdown victory late. 
And in and, and all due respect to the kind people in Venton, Louisiana, too, I have I have uh, Delta Downs a little higher than 237 on the horse racing rankings, <laughs> not to the track rankings. Let's get to our last one. Got a little double barrel uh, action here. That's right. Both Paul and I not comparing notes, but this is both one of our picks. We're going to Louisville and Georgia Tech ACC battle. Not as extreme as Tulane and ULL. But there's a gap on the level of competition that these these two teams have played. Just like ULL, the uh, the, the Louisville Cardinals are two and zero. They play two light uh, light opponents and in a bye again, and uh, averaging almost uh, 600 yards a game in those two games. Um, and then on the other side, Georgia Tech, we got well, they were on center stage in Dublin and uh, looked really good. It's all about Haynes King, man, and it's a true dual threat. He is not the prettiest, most aesthetically pleasing runner out there, but he's effective. And, man, look at what he's doing right now. He's, uh, he's averaging nine yard, over nine yards an attempt, six TDs and only one interception, and then 53 yards uh, on the ground a game and four more touchdowns. And what that does is allows him to run that little option, something else to prepare for opposing teams, and also his legs moving those chains on key third downs as well. Georgia Tech's only loss, they're 3-1 and one right now, is at Syracuse. And, man, Kyle McCord was on fire that day. He threw for 381, four TDs and no interceptions. And it took all of that to beat Georgia Tech 31-28. to Louisville's really good. Austin P and Jackson State in a bye. And then Georgia Tech. And also Georgia Tech, uh, are they getting a little leg weary after that trip to Dublin uh, with uh, with no breaks involved is there, in, there as well. But we both like the Yellow Jackets. Just think this is too much. And, again, They've been pushed more. They're more finely tuned, I've got to believe, than the Louisville Cardinals. Yeah, first I'm going to start out with a, a little comment uh, and, and kind of a side note about Haynes King. You know, he's he's a bulldog. He, he's a yes. he's a tough guy. You know, he he competes, and and I really like him. He actually uh, just is a little nugget of information for uh, your listeners, our listeners. He played high school football at Longview, Texas, in the eastern part of the state of Texas for his dad, who was head coach at Longview, John King. And Longview's produced, you know, Bobby Taylor played at Notre Dame and Philadelphia Eagles, pretty good player. I think Trent Williams has been a pretty good offensive lineman. Those guys are Longview Lobos, as is Haynes King, and I really like him. Uh, we've got a fairly unique situation, as you kind of ma- uh, you kind of alluded to, in this ACC matchup uh, this week, Louisville – off of a bye, they're only playing their third game of the season. Uh, meanwhile, Georgia Tech played that week zero game against Florida State, a very impressive performance over in Dublin. They're playing for the fifth straight week. So it's Louisville's third game, Georgia Tech's fifth game. I think you can approach that and view that in a couple of different ways. But I see it uh, as an advantage for Georgia Tech at this point, this early, relatively early point in the season, having four games under their belt. You know, hypothetically, I think they're kind of nearing midseason form, and I think that really is important when you're talking about the offensive continuity and flow and so forth. And as you mentioned also, Louisville, they've had a couple of tap-ins. I mean, FCS, Austin P, uh, and then Jacksonville State, although an FBS team, uh, they're, you know, near the bottom of the FBS. Uh, and, and meanwhile, like you mentioned, Georgia Tech, you know, played Florida State. They're maybe not who we thought they were at the beginning of the year, but still an impressive win in Dublin and then went to Syracuse uh, and narrowly got beat by a field goal. So, you know, we think, we think Louisville's a bona fide top 20 team, but we're not really sure yet because they haven't played anybody. Georgia Tech, though, on the other hand, a little more battle-tested, more of a, a known commodity, if you will. So I like that aspect here. In Georgia Tech, also, they have performed well recently in the underdog role since the start of the 2022 season. Georgia Tech 12-4 and four against the spread uh, as an underdog, and they're 8-3 and three as a double-digit underdog, as they will be Saturday uh, there against Louisville. Last year, season opener for both teams at the Mercedes-Benz Dome there in uh, Atlanta. Very entertaining game. Louisville defeated uh, Georgia Tech 39-34, King passed for 313 yards, ran for another 53, kind of his coming out party as Georgia Tech's quarterback. You know, this line being 10, and last year on a neutral field, that line closed at 7.5. So it almost implies that these teams 
compare pretty much equally in terms of their gap as they did last year, if that makes sense. They're about the same distance apart uh, in power ratings. But I don't really buy that. I think Georgia Tech is a little bit better, maybe even more than a little bit better. In Louisville, I'm not sure. I think there may be the same would be kind of the ceiling. So I think we're getting a little value here with the double digits. I like Georgia Tech plus 10 over Louisville on the road. Last year, it was a Dublin game participant that finally caught up with them, a little fatigue in Louisville and Notre Dame. Difference was, though, they had really tough games back-to-back against Ohio State and at Duke that came down to the last the last drive of the game. Georgia Tech has a little bit lighter load before they head into Louisville uh, with uh, a similar path. All right, so double-barrel uh, shot uh, right there on the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. That's our best bets uh, for the week. Uh, Paul and I do that with the high-profile games and in our best bets each and every week right here on the Sports Betters Paradise. For Paul Stone, I'm Jimmy Ott on the Sports Betters Paradise on the Bet Rivers Network.